Today we begin with a very special keynote address. It's my honor to introduce to you Dr. Marcella Alshan, Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. She has the distinction of being both an infectious disease physician and a PhD economist. She has authored pathbreaking research on trust in medical care, for example, showing how the public disclosure of the Tuskegee syphilis experiments in 1972 generated medical mistrust that lowered utilization of medical services by black men in the region, reducing their life expectancy almost a decade later. Her study of physician workforce diversity in Oakland, California demonstrated how black men were more likely to take up preventive care after meeting with a racially concordant doctor. In 2021, she won the MacArthur Fellowship, also known as a Genius Grant, for these and for many other contributions to our understanding of the origins of health inequalities. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alshon. Thank you so much, uh, Nicole, for that generous uh, introduction. Can people see my slides? Okay. Okay, perfect. Um, so it's, it's really an honor to be here. I had the opportunity to um, view last year's keynote um, by Valerie Wilson and two years ago by Ann Case. Both were tremendous uh, presentations, one on race and ethnic and um, financial well-being, um, and then Ann talking about dust and despair in the future of capitalism. They really set the landscape uh, with important observations and descriptions about how inequality in the United States operates. Um, in retirement and in mortality rates. So my modest goal is to build on that. Um, I was really struck by something Anne said, which was, uh, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And that really dovetailed with some of the work that I've been doing with co-authors, trying to flush out our understanding of representation, what it means, why it matters. And today I also wanted to uh, talk a little bit about how it affects the rules. And by this, I mean the institutional rules uh, institutions like Harvard, um, like SSA, that determines who gets what. Okay, starting with representation. So I'm going to toggle between a couple of different definitions of representation. First and foremost, I think representation is about accurate description. Um, and it, with a little bit of abusive terminology, because in the, when we're talking about representation in the census, we're actually talking about accurate enumeration. And this is important for lots of different reasons. Um, accurate enumeration is important because we use, we all use these data when we're trying to forecast or do demographic simulations uh, and try and understand what the country is going to look like and, and years or decades from now. For my line of work as an applied microeconomist, I'm usually using these same data sorts in a retrospective manner, trying to understand the impacts of different programs and policy, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, they're also hugely important, particularly the census, for the allocation of resources to the tune of about $1.5 trillion in federal spending um, over a decade is attributable to the census enumeration. It has a very strong link to representation. That's why um, it is included in the Constitution, because it um, allocates congressional seats. Um, and another important aspect, though, of uh, particularly the surveys that we do that uh, are related to the census is in the absence of having a national health system, which we do not have in the United States. It's very hard for researchers. You can't really just you know, tabulate, go to this national registry and tabulate things very easily. So we're critically reliant on surveys uh, to take the pulse and, and understand where diseases are coming from, what their level might be when it's time to uh, count uh, emergencies, and, uh, and also to understand exposures and whatnot. And so we're very reliant on things like MAPS, NHANES, H, the Health and Retirement um, Study, and so on and so forth. So much so that the CDC actually developed a survey called PULSE to understand the COVID-19 pandemic sort of in the middle of the, uh, the beginning of the pandemic. I'm going to talk about representation in a second way, representation as it relates to participation. And here I mean, do you see people that you can relate to in the process? And what does that mean for how you view the outcome of that process? Representation in terms of participation kind of imbues the outcome of that process with a certain legitimacy. Now, legitimacy is often a term we hear applied to sort of political outcomes and whether leaders um, attained their power or authority in a legitimate way. 
But in fact, we think this term has much broader purchase and we're gonna apply it in a few slides um, to the study of, the health, of health. Now, with respect to you know, representation as accurate description or enumeration, there's been a lot of ink spilled on that. Here's just a snapshot of some of the recent um, press uh, articles on the subject talking about either the census or missing criminal justice statistics, missing counts of hate crimes against Asians, and so on and so forth. One article that really caught my attention was one from 2015 in the New York Times, authored by Justin Wolfers and colleagues, where they said that there were 1.5 million missing uh, Black men. Now, this was a fairly straightforward demographic exercise. What they did was they looked at across different age groups and calculated sex ratios across different racial and ethnic groups as well. And what they found was among the working age population of individuals 25 to 54, for every 100 Black women, there were only 83 Black men. And this led them to conclude, um, this with a couple of other bells and whistles, led them to conclude that um, this 1.5 million missing Black men number. Now, they um, talked about mechanisms being things like the very high disproportionate incarceration rate for Black men, as well as premature mortality. And that's true. Um, they brought up you know, HIV AIDS and, and violence associated deaths. Um, but in addition, the Urban Institute, when reviewing that article, brought up this other uh, sort of well-known feature, which is just that Black men are undercounted um, often in, in uh, surveys and even in the census. So I wanted to kind of turn to that next. So this is actually looking across different decades from 1960 to 2010. This is um, put together by the Urban Institute drawing on some work uh, from census itself. And uh, what we can see is that uh, Black individuals uh, are in the blue, total is in yellow, non-Black is in uh, this Black line. And overall, the undercount had been declining over time from 1960 to 2010, but it was still higher uh, for Black Americans. And that gap, that relative gap, has actually been fairly constant. Um, so it's good news in the sense that the undercount seems to be up to the 2010 at least declining, but also problematic news in the sense that if we're talking about sort of fixed budgets or a fixed budget constraint and allocation of resources among groups, unless we actually close that gap, we might not expect to see staggering differences in the distribution of um, scarce resources. Now, that kind of belies some important differences in, in terms of intersectionality looking across age groups or across gender. So in the 2010 census, this is still 2010, there was a slight overcount of white individuals by about 0.8%. That black outer gender count was 2.1%. But that was kind of hiding a pretty severe undercount of uh, Black young children, zero to four years old, and even more severe among Black men, again, kind of overlapping with the Wolfers article of 25 um, to 54 year old. Um, so how did things look in uh, 2020? Unfortunately, things were quite a bit worse despite the census um, as best attempts. Um, so the undercount for Black Americans was lower ranging from, in this figure, 0.4 to 4.4%. And unfortunately, it was quite a bit lower in states that had some of the highest uh, Black populations, in, particularly in, um, in the South. Now, um, it's not just racial and ethnic groups that tend to be undercounted. Um, this also, we see uh, a relative overcount of individuals that actually own their home or households that are uh, owner, have ownership status versus those that are renters. So the overcount was about 0.43% for owners. Um, and then for renters, there was an undercount of 1.48%, a little bit larger than in the 2010 census. And then we already looked at this um, for children. So children are kind of well established that they're undercounted, particularly those young children, those zero to four year olds. Um, it's about 2.8% in the 2020 census. Um, but of course, again, as I showed you before, that undercount tends to be lower for children that are Black or Hispanic or minority. All right, so this table kind of summarizes the 2010 and 2020 census side by side. We can see that that overcount for non-Hispanic white Americans kind of doubled from 0.83% to 1.6%. Black or African American, the undercount increased to 3.3% on average. Um, American Indian or Alaskan Native increased as well, uh, particularly for those that were on the reservation. Um, that is generally a, a, 
you have an, a problem there, um, which worsened in, in this last census. But the real sort of headline was Hispanic or Latino. So that uh, undercount went from 1.5% increase by 3.5 percentage points to nearly 5% in this 2020 census. So that um, could be because of a lot of the browbeating, if you recall, around citizenship questions um, that occurred and, and really seemed to, we're, we're not exactly sure the causality there, but it, we really do see a drop off um, in that, in that, uh, in terms of uh, that uh, under counting rate. So this is the ACS, and the ACS is taking, uh, uh, play, taking the place of the census short form and uh, has been deployed uh, ever since you know the 2000s or so. These are the coverage rates. You can see the formula down here, but it's essentially asking out of all the population that we believe to exist based on prior censuses and vital statistics, what fraction is actually in the sample um, that we're actually trying to enumerate? And what we, unfortunately, what we tend to see here is the coverage rate, particularly again, for Black Americans and Hispanic Americans, that's that red and the orange line, have been going down um, over time. And I actually don't have a good explanation uh, for that fact in particular. Um, we also see at the same time that response rates for the ACS have been going down. We didn't actually include the 2020 response rate because it was just so low. It kind of uh, skewed the entire um, graphic here. Um, these, these data points here, they, they seem to be um, significant outliers were due to uh, government shutdowns and the like. Um, but at the same time that the response rate um, are going down, we can see that refusal rates are going up. Um, so it, again, it sort of begs the question about who's in the sample. And typically the statistical way to deal with these things is to sort of upweight individuals, but that's kind of presuming that people who aren't in the sample are similar to those that are in the sample for the ACS. Now, census representation, again, enumeration is particularly important because it affects the accuracy of pretty much all of our other survey data sets. So they all inherit their sampling or their weighting from the census itself. And these are just some well-known surveys that we all typically use listed here. Um, now, researchers who are interested in equity are also more and more relying on some of these surveys. And this is just one possibly pertinent example here after the um, SSA discontinued publication of race and ethnicity for you know, various legitimate reasons, researchers who are interested in how social securities relates to these disparities often have to then go back and link to these surveys to obtain these variables. So you can see how errors in the census kind of can then be spill it over and carry on to these surveys and to all the other research that we um, kind of try and do. Now, as I mentioned, this has been something that I've been interested in for um, quite some time. Um, this is a project um, that I uh, undertook with um, the state of Minnesota, along with a bunch of development economists, uh, their names, uh, kind of familiar names listed here, who have expertise working with disadvantaged populations in low resource settings and trying to elicit their views. So um, the context of this survey was in the Twin Cities. Um, this was about uh, maybe five or six months after the murder of George Floyd. Um, the state was actually trying to deploy some new testing centers for COVID-19. This was pre-vaccination and really needing to get the views, solicit the views of those who were most in need. So what we ended up doing is working with food shelves or food pantries. And um, in order to see how we could um, best improve the response rates, we did a randomized trial. We randomized the types of flyers that went out at the food shelf date level. And so in one of these flyers, you can see we're really emphasizing and making more salient the role of the state in collecting these data. So the state of Minnesota wants to know how COVID-19 is affecting you. In the second um, flyer, we take a more generic tone and this top line here talks about academic researchers trying to understand how people are being affected by uh, COVID-19. And then it, we cross randomize this with a financial a monetary incentive in order to complete the survey, a low powered or high powered, we called it $10 or $20 respectively. Now here are the results. Overall, the response rates were low. So overall, we only had about 8% of a response rate. But you can see here the researcher framing versus the government framing, there was also differential take up across the two. Um, statistically significant different with researcher framing, um, this is all under the low incentive regime. Researcher framing getting a little over 11% uh, take up rates where the government framing only got about 5% uh, take up rates. Now what happens when we um, put in those uh, bigger financial incentives, so just doubling it from $10 to 
Interestingly, we don't see any movement whatsoever in the researcher frame, but we see this really big responsiveness for government frames. So this is um, basically five times, going from 5% response rate to over 25% response rate. And the difference between those two is obviously eyeballing it statistically significant. So what's going on here? So one theory that we had in mind is that maybe people are responding to the researcher frame out of sort of intrinsic motivation to help the researchers, et cetera, et cetera, and are fairly inelastic to these uh, incentives. Whereas um, the government frame, maybe it's viewed as more transactional, giving the government data in this way. And so we're able to get you know, these higher responses. What we're also interested in and why we don't quite have a working paper is because you know, actually how you frame and whether you incentivize can also change the nature of the responses you get in really interesting ways. And that's what we're exploring um, in the current moment. But a question that I have taken to um, adding to my to my experimental work is uh, questions about whether people have ever filled out a census. I often work with disadvantaged populations and I just find the answers to that question to be fascinating. So here from our Minnesota field survey, we see that overall, about 42% of our respondents, I didn't tell you the sample size, it's a little over uh, around 500, 600 individuals in both of these, um, in these surveys that I'm showing you here, 42% um, say they've never filled out a census uh, form. And that is differential across black and white respondents. So it's 15% among black respondents and 32% among white respondents. And this is in a state, by the way, just to give you a better, broader context, which actually does fairly good um, in terms of the, compared to the national average in, in terms of um, um, responding to uh, census forms without needing to have follow ups and, and callbacks, et cetera. Uh, in a completely different context, in an experiment that I uh, did with Sarah Eckmeyer of Bocconi, where we were trying to improve the take up of flu vaccine shots among men who don't have a college education. Here we found similarly high rates of people saying that they've actually, these men have never filled out um, a census form, about 34%, again, higher, not quite as large a disparity, but across black and white men. Um, it, in general, when you're working with an online platform, you're also getting people that at least have access to Wi-Fi or a smartphone or something like that. So that is selected in that way too. This was a catch-all question where we just listed a bunch of those surveys that were on the slides, you know, of the CPS, SIP, et cetera. And again, we see about 40% say they've never filled out any one of these um, um, surveys. So now I just wanted to um, talk a little bit more again about my own um, domain of health. And as I mentioned before, we don't have a, a database, a national database of health information to query. What we have instead uh, are a couple different things. One is, of course, a lot of commercialized data products. What are these um, companies doing? They're getting the data for various reasons. Maybe they're um, getting them from health systems in order to um, ascertain quality metrics. Maybe they're purchasing themselves and they repackage these and then sell them uh, to research and to other in, in, in interested entities. Now, these data sets inherently have a lot of churn. Why? Because the system has a lot of churn. Employee sponsored insurers, you know that you know yourself that your employer can change your plan and there's churn there. There's a churn when you take a different job or move to a different state. And so it's extremely difficult as someone who's, you know, as an infectious disease doctor, we are very interested in exposure history. So it's extremely difficult to put together, you know, the life cycle of an individual from, from in utero to where they might be um, um, when they're entering the workforce and to see all their exposures. It also affects what I want to call the geography of research, because who can actually purchase these data sets? Um, it's not just, you know, imminent universities. Sometimes it's imminent scholars within those universities that can actually afford access to these proprietary data sets. We might not be getting all those questions asked and answered that we would want um, if the data sets were more freely available. What do we have? Well, we have Medicare. And as a naive um, undergraduate graduate student, I used to think, why do people become inherently more interesting when they're 65? Because as a physician, I think, well, it's pretty continuous health risk and all of that. Well, clearly it's because that's what researchers have access to. They have access to people. They get to see people when they turn 65 plus. 
with the, particularly through fee for service Medicare. But of course, as Medicare Advantage increases, you know, the fee for service population is uh, eroding over time. And we have the same issue with Medicare Advantage, um, you know, insurer plans entering and exiting, and that same churn where people are always selecting every year what kind of plan that they want. There's inertia, um, but there's also entry and exit. Um, Veterans Affairs or TRICARE, those are our other options. Um, I was a VA physician for a while. I love the VA system. The EMR um, CPRS is fantastic. Uh, however, it's predominantly male. And it also picks up when, you know, when they enter the service. And because we're not drafting anymore, you know, this is a selected sample of men who are entering military service, a selected sample of men who might be continuing on in the VA system, um, et cetera. So national vital statistics, those seem to definitely have, you know, everyone covered, births and deaths and whatnot. Well, you probably you might already know this fact, but in fact, how you um, you know how you're recorded, how your death is recorded, really depends on what county uh, you're in. So, for example, in this is a figure from the CDC, in these green um, in these green states, these are states where they have elected coroners. These are lay officials, um, and they are the ones who are deciding the cause of death. Uh, in these white you have a mix of coroners and medical examiners. And only in these dark gray, do you really have a centralized system where a medical examiner, a trained medical professional, is ascertaining the cause of death um, that occurred for the individual. And what we can see, this is from the earlier days of the epidemic. So excess mortality has since increased. But this does seem to um, you know, correlate with how many excess deaths are actually attributed to COVID-19, obviously, for being elected. And there's some partisanship. Uh, involved in determining cause of death, we might expect what you die of uh, might differ. And, and of course, testing also differs across these locations as well. Okay, well, just a note on COVID-19. I mean, I think uh, I'm showing you death rates and I'm showing you rate ratios compared to the white population taken from the CDC, recapitulated in Kaiser. Um, and I'm showing you them across race and ethnicity. Why am I not showing you case data? Well, because of only about two thirds of case data actually has race and ethnicity. Why am I not showing you hospitalization rates? Well, because, you know, as you can see in these notes, Maryland just temporarily halted transmission of COVID-19 associated hospitalizations, which has thrown off their metrics for that. So what we have, and of course, I just showed you that, <laughs> that the coroner might determine the cause of death, but this is really what we have, at least um, in terms of completeness, uh, when trying to assess the, the effects of this massive pandemic across race and ethnicity. Now, the unadjusted estimates show that there is a slight disadvantage and maybe a, uh, for African Americans relative to whites and a slight possibly advantage for Hispanics relative to whites. That, of course, is extremely augmented when we actually flip the sign, if you will, uh, when, once we age adjust. Why? Well, because both Hispanic and African American populations skew younger for different demographic reasons. Unfortunately, for African Americans, it's mostly related to, um, it's thought to be related to premature mortality. And, you know, I just want to make an analogy with medicine again, because there's a recent article um, in Annals of Internal Medicine, which showed that, in fact, BMI adjusted age adjusted rates of diabetes, it's also known for hypertension, tend to emerge earlier in, uh, in minority populations. And so this doctor is actually making a plea, you know, the simplicity of a single screening threshold for all Americans is alluring, but is deeply inequitable in light of these facts that we know these disease patterns emerge earlier for various reasons in uh, different groups. Okay, so now let's talk about the second you know, represent the idea of representation, this notion of legitimacy. Here I'm going to turn to some recent work um, I've been uh, 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 honored to do, along with some co-authors on clinical trials. So clinical trials are just the data that we use, the evidence base that the FDA uses to, to um, approve marketing of a new medication in the United States. They have to prove safety and efficacy. And uh, what we see here, these are data of, made available by the FDA since 2015, the snapshots data, is that they are very underrepresenting um, of Black individuals. So the median share of Black in these trials is uh, about 5% compared to their population average. And this is not even comparing to disease burden, which would augment these disparities. Um, and when we look at, you know, how, how what does a successful trial do, it, it leads to a new medication coming to the market here using MEPS data. We can see that this also, uh, we also can recapitulate some of this disparity when we're looking at the prescription rate for new medications. It's uh, much higher 
for white uh, Americans than uh, black Americans, and that disparity actually increases over the first five years that the drug is on market. So um, we wanted to understand these disparities a little bit better. We ran two experiments, one among primary care physicians and another among patients. And in the interest of time, I'll just tell you the high level things that we did. We randomized, we showed physicians eight different drug profile, anti-diabetic drug profiles, and we randomized both the efficacy of the drug, so how effective it was in reducing your diabetes, as well as the share black, the representativeness of the sample on which the drug was tested, holding everything else constant. And we asked them about their prescribing intentions, the primary outcome of interest. For our patients, we did a similar but simpler study. We held efficacy completely constant, and we just shared changed the representation um, of the trial. So a low representative trial of Black Americans versus um, of Black participants versus a higher um, share of Black. Here's what we found. So here's efficacy on the x-axis. So higher efficacy means the drug works better as reported in the trial. And we broke our physicians into two groups, physicians that treat mainly white patients, our acronym is PWPs. Given the segregation in the healthcare system and 60% of uh, the population of America is white, this is a, a, a large majority of uh, doctors, um, as well as PVPs, physicians that see at least some um, black patients. We can see this nice upward sloping line so the more efficacious the drug is, the more the physicians were interested in prescribing it. That is uh, uh, very reasonable. When we look at physicians that treat Black patients and show them a non-representative sample, um, we actually see the same slope of a line. So doctors are responding the same, more efficacious, more willingness to prescribe, but a level shift down as if they're discounting that information on the non-representative evidence base. But this is why I really like this paper, because it actually allows us to close some gaps, at least in the context of our survey experiment. When we showed these same doctors a representative sample, we got them prescribing at the same rate as the doctors, um, the, the white doctors on average. There was no difference at all. Um, it was almost like it didn't come top of mind uh, for the white doctors when they saw these two different samples. But we can close gaps with a representative sample for our physicians that treat Black patients. Well, we also wanted to pose the same question to, to patients. Doctors are supposed to be agents of the patients and health is a production between doctors and patients. And what we see is kind of the exact same phenomenon. Here we're looking at posteriors on efficacy. If you remember, we told them the exact same efficacy across the board, but this question, uh, this sort of detail, if you will, of what was a share black in the trial really um, widen this chasm between how much these patients thought the drug would work for them um, between black and white anti uh, patients with hypertension. And we can again close that gap and get them all thinking that that drug is going to be efficacious for them by simply making the um, sample more representative. So I'm happy to talk about that more in the Q&A. Um, but I just wanted to say, you know, that's the context of a uh, of a, an experiment. What about real life? What about real data? So here what we're showing is the median percent black in these FDA pivotal trials. And then on the y-axis, we're showing you that prescription rate gap. And, you know, um, we see this is different conditions. We've called out cancer and HIV AIDS because, you know, just a lot of money, federal dollars have been spent on those two conditions. They also have very robust networks that keep these trials domestic as opposed to offshoring. And I want to say that this line is positively sloped, meaning, of course, that the more representative the trial is, the lower the gap is between Black and white Americans in terms of prescription rates. And, um, and, and this, this is actually robust, this line, the slope of the line to dropping HIV AIDS, but that's not actually the point. The point is that HIV AIDS is an outlier, and it's an outlier for historical and important rule-making reasons. HIV AIDS has always had a very strong activist community, and the way that the trials are done are such that there has to be a community advisory um, board sitting on the protocols as the protocols are developed. These trials are recruiting more and more in safety, much more than in safety net hospitals than in for the cancer network. And importantly, of course, there's the Ryan White Care Act that helps to actually pay for new drugs for individuals um, that have uh, no other source. So that, that just gives me that we actually call this inclusive infrastructure. We're not just talking about buildings, we're talking about a whole set of rules and protocols that allow HIV AIDS to close that gap. 
And that brings me to just the final point I'll make here, which is rules. So rules are important. Rules like who sits on the protocol, who designs it, um, and where and where the trial is recruiting from. And you know, if we look at Social Security, and you all are the experts, certainly not me, but there is this history of rules that you know again excluded agricultural and domestic workers, which had uh, a negative impact certainly on Black and Southern Americans. This minimum age of 62, you know, that is going to disadvantage people that have lower life expectancies. Uh, I'm sure you all know that, at least for their retirement benefits. Benefits time to earnings. It was great to see how the progressive nature of that um, uh, replacement rate plays a part, but it still is the case that the more you earn, the more you get. The work credit minimum, you know, what does that do to people that are in uncompensated uh, work? Of course, you know, parenting is one of the toughest jobs there is, maybe second only to watching your parents die and, and fail and help themselves. And so, you know, what are we doing about, uh, what are we, how are we gonna make rules that, that compensate them? 10 year minimum, that's gonna disqualify individuals who are less tethered to that institution, either legally or because of this next point, incarceration rates, which are incredibly high. It's, it's, a, it's a commonplace situation for many communities for the men to, to be arrested and incarcerated um, at some point in their lives, maybe multiple points in their lives. Um, and, and so, you know, I think these are rules that we're making and, and we wanna just think about whether they're increasing um, inequality. And I think in the interest of time, I won't say much more about SSDI except S or SSI. I think you're all probably aware of the Low and Castafari and Cabral and Dillinger articles that just raise this question of whether, whether we're looking through these um, rules about who is disabled through a gendered lens, um, given the history of, of those um, sorts of, um, uh, uh, given the history of those programs. Um, so my final sort of definition of representation, you know, we've talked about representation as accurate description, as enumeration, as participation. What about representation as leadership? Who is leading? Um, because that also affects the rules and the rules then affects who gets represented. Um, now, I was trained both as an infectious disease clinician where basically we get consulted to do chart biopsies. We're always very interested in the history of the patient and by an economic historian Claudia Golden, who always encouraged me to ask these questions, you know, where did the data come from? How were they collected? Who is missing? Um, and then, of course, with the rules, when were they created? Who were they serving? And how do they impact inequality today? And, and you know, at a minimum, are we, are we actively contributing, recapitulating, reproducing some of the inequality that the system already has? So last, I want to just say one thing, which is I've been basically, you know, speaking poorly about our federalist system. One benefit of the federalist system, yeah, obviously not data, but um, but we can get all of these policy experiments. Here's a great one. I'm sure you'll see it presented um, if you haven't already, showing that paid, pam paid, pam paid family leave can um, reduce the disassociation of women from the labor force. So that is one benefit of having um, having this uh, federalist system that we that we have inherited. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, so we have we have a few questions and um, just just a little bit of time for for some Q and A. Um, so I'll I'll will start with um, a question about um, solutions. So um, I think you know th this this um, I I just the 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 research you've done is so compelling um, about all the various representation um, gaps. Um, and I noticed that a lot of that, you know, another hallmark of your work is that you often touch on potential solutions for, um, for some of these problems that you identify. Um, we saw that in the clinical trials study. I'd love to hear more about that. Um, but what can you tell us about, you know, where do we go to find solutions? How do we know how to fix these problems when we see them? Yeah, I think that's a great question, and um, and it can get really uh, overwhelming and frustrating. Um, but I do think that you know finding those like whether whether you're looking looking for the heterogeneity, you know, where is the state that's doing well? What is the medical condition that's doing well? And what are the hallmark features? Um, and I think we all do this intuitively already, but just really kind of 
um, digging in and, and, and making it active, uh, even case studies. I mean, literally the HIV AIDS example is a case study, um, but the fact is that they have instituted these policies you know, decades before other conditions, and that has led to massive differences in the representation and the prescribing rates and saved, you know, countless lives among uh, Black and Hispanic and other disadvantaged Americans. Um, so I, I think that is, you know, every question that says, you know, every question that we pose, which is like, why are things so bad and why, why are things not working? There's probably another way to pose that is, is like, well, where is it working better? <laughs> And um, in trying to really uh, unpack that and understand that using when we can, you know, the econometric tools, but if not, you know, the qualitative social sciences um, and, and, um, and narratives as well. And is it is it always going to be that we find solutions in the US? That's another thing. I think what's really interesting when we're, thank you. Yes, I mean, that's, and one of the, so, one of Ann Case's points when she was talking was just looking at the productivity of the United States, you know, with with uh, GD, the, the per capita health spending on the x-axis and life expectancy on the y-axis. And when you think about all of the health economists who are always writing about productivity in the within the United States, we're missing like 90% of the possible productivity gains, maybe more, because in, in truth, we are the outlier. We spend too much we have lower average life expectancy, we have the large, you know, very large disparities. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and I think, you know, I think we're getting, we're getting to the point where we're also seeing it starting to drag on our innovation uh, for various reasons. Um, but I think, you know, uh, just in the context of clinical trials, where does a, you know, where does Pfizer want to test its vaccine? It wants to go to a country where it can easily query um, the database and, and, and actually really carefully follow people. Um, so uh, something to keep in mind. Yeah. So you, you, um, you mentioned, um, you know, at the beginning of your talk, you talked about the um, undercount problems in surveys. And um, many of us are, are thinking about, you know, like technical solutions to those problems ex post when doing research. And I guess question for you is, is there any kind of, you know, statistical solution um, to to this, fixing this problem in, in data, or or you know, does that not even really exist? I mean, I can sort of I, yeah, no, take it both ways. That's, a, that's another phenomenal question. I'm very pessimistic on the ex post waiting. I mean, I I really I'm not I'm not convinced that the people that are in are similar to the people outside. And I think going back um, to Dr. Kijikazi's opening comments or the work of the HIV activists, you know, you really have to build those community bridges, so particularly when you're not trying to enumerate everyone when you're doing a survey just by oversampling, you're just going to oversample, you're still not going to get the full picture. I think we, you know, I think that's helpful, but I think actually trying to understand the community, meet people where they are, financial incentives. I mean, I'm an economist, tend to work, <laughs> um, and, and trying to understand, you know, how that affects quality, what questions can be asked. And again, I actually think, uh, speaking of looking across um, countries, looking across disciplines, development economists have worked a lot on these issues. Um, as well in terms of using social networks. Um, the community actually knows a lot about who should be targeted um, and things like that. So um, yeah, I think there, uh, there's a lot to be done, but I'm not convinced that just like a reweight uh, is the answer. Yeah, and so, and then last question, you know, we often, um, you know, and those of us running studies where we have incentives for participation often will get pushback from, institutional review boards about the magnitude of, of the incentives. And, and so I thought your, your contrast of, you know, kind of the high powered and low powered incentives was very interesting and wondered if it changed, you mentioned it might have changed the types of answers you got, but did it change who participated? Yeah, that's a, I, I won't have to go back to that particular analysis. I think if it's going to, and I think Winnie, um, uh, uh, and uh, Michael Greenstone uh, at University of Chicago also have findings along these lines. But if it's changing who, 
participated. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Right. It may be in a good way. <laughs> and, and actually, you know, the national, again, you know, we as social science, as a social scientist had trials, randomized trials have just been coming on board in the last, you know, decade or, or maybe two. Uh, recently, I was part of a NASM committee, National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine committee to look at clinical trials and how to improve representation there. And there is a section on financial incentives. It says the IRB should really be looking at whether this is an ethical um, study for people to participate in. And that is the standard. And if it's and if it is not harmful to them, or if the benefits out, um, outweigh the, the the risks, et cetera, et cetera, that is the the margin that they sh should be assessing things on. And there are so many reasons why um, financial incentives, including targeted financial incentives, might actually improve the representation, help pay for or or in kind transportation food, you know, um, given all the structural barriers we know that different communities face. Yeah. Well, I wish we had more time. I think um, we could all talk to you all day um, and continue the conversation. But I just like, you know, thank you so much for for that wonderful keynote lecture. And um, without without further ado, we'll um, we'll end and move on to the next panel.